Backed by popular demand and not leaving until the Marlins lose a game. It's the Ethan Badowski Reaction Report. What's going on, everybody? The Marlins won again last night to improve their record to an unbelievable 7-1. and one. I just really can't believe what's going on in Miami right now. Um, a lot of people are finally starting to take notice of the Marlins as the story of the season so far. It's undeniable that they're the story of the season. It's a team nobody expected to win any ball games this year expect, except people in Miami. And now all of a sudden they've won seven games to start the year and they are 7-1 and one with this kind of roster after losing 18 players to COVID-19. It's truly unbelievable and I really just can't talk enough about it. Um, I could go on for an hour, but it's halftime of the Champions League games right now, so I've got, uh, I'm on a short clock here. So let's just jump right into last night's game um, and, and start taking a look at it before we take a look at tonight's game. Um, it was the Major League debut for Humberto Mejia, a guy that I've talked about that I'm pretty high on towards the back end of the Marlins top 30. Had never pitched above high A ball before making his Major League debut last night. It was the seventh straight night that a Marlins player has made their Major League debut, and he was pretty good. Um, it wasn't a long outing for him. He threw 67 pitches in two and a third innings. Um, and that was just a result of him throwing a ton of strikes. He threw 43 strikes out of his 67 pitches. And in his first like his first 14 pitches, 11 of them were for strikes. So he was in and around the strike zone a bunch. Guys were fouling him off. Um, but it was a good, impressive start from him. I was impressed with the stuff from Mejia. The fastball had a lot of life to it. He was sitting 93-94, but it had some zip. It was running in and away from hitters, um, and he got a bunch of swings and misses on it. I think, actually, his first three strikeouts were all on 93-mile-an-hour fastballs. Um, one of them was 94, but all on fastballs up in the zone getting swings and misses on them. So that was really great to see. His curveball is tremendous. I mean, he's got a great hook. It's got a ton of depth and movement to it, um, and it got a couple swings. Uh, it got some swings and misses. Uh, it even froze a guy. His last strikeout of the game was just perfectly placed. I think it was on Ahmed Rosario, and he just placed it beautifully at the bottom of the zone, um, froze him, and that was his sixth strikeout of the game. So the final line for Mejia: 2.1 innings pitched, um, two hits. One run. The only run he gave up was on a homer. It got clobbered. Don't get me wrong. Dom Smith took him deep to right field to welcome him to the big leagues. Um, but it, a, a clean start. Otherwise, he allowed two walks and the six strikeouts as well. You would like to see him cut down on throwing so many pitches, go out of the strike zone. He was throwing a lot of waste pitches and not getting a ton of swings and misses at them and be a little more aggressive because he was, again, he was working in and around the strike zone, but he was getting a lot of pitches fouled off. So I'd like to see him go for some more swing and miss because I think there's some of it in his game with a good with that good hook and the good life on his fastball. Nonetheless, it was a good debut for Mejia. It was good to see a young guy out there. It always is. And um, I think we'll see him again. I, there's no reason not to start him in five days and give him another shot in the rotation. Um, but we need him to start working deeper into games. Then it was the bullpen, and they took over from there, and they threw one, two, three, four, five um, relievers in the game last night. Two of them chewed up a bunch of the majority of the innings. Justin Schaefer, who we talked about, Gator, great. He went two innings. Stephen Tarpley had two clean innings. Um, he looked really nice out of the bullpen with the lefty coming in, and it was interesting. We expected to see him in more of a closer role, but it was good to see him be able to eat up some innings, which is something we're going to talk about later, is something that the Marlins really need right now. Um, so after that, it was up to James Hoyt. James Hoyt let up a run in two thirds of an inning, but he, um, fig finished. Let me see. Hold on. Do math here. Schaefer got into the, um, fourth Tarpley. This was probably into the sixth or seventh inning. Um, and then Blyer, sorry, this was going into the set six or seven, whatever it was. Um, the Mets got one back off of Hoyt. Um, and then Blyer allowed a run, um, and he, he in only an inning pitch, he allowed a walk and a run, or and a hit as well. Um, his run, though, was on a throwing error from Brian Anderson with the bases loaded. The Marlins got exactly what they needed. The bases were loaded. Um, they got a ground ball to third base to Brian Anderson, and he just kind of rushed it. It was a weird play. It looked really weird, um, but... Anderson um, threw it away and that scored a run. It made it 4-3 with the bases loaded and two outs in the eighth. And then Nick Vincent came in and shut it down. 
um, and he was really impressive, actually. But, um, again, it looked like the bullpen was kind of like, you know, you know, we're, we're looking for it. We're like, okay, is it going to happen now, you know? Um, it, it seemed due to happen last night, but give credit to the bullpen. They were able to hold on. Um, Nick Vincent got the last two outs of the eighth and then the three outs in the ninth, and he looked pretty good. He only allowed a hit um, and didn't allow any runs. He worked out of the bases loaded jam, as I mentioned, in the eighth, and that was huge because it seemed like, you know, this this was it for the Marlins. Okay, here comes the bullpen. You know, this is the makeshift bullpen that – we were expecting to see load the bases, give up a bunch of runs. And in, in years past, especially last year, you probably see the Marlins give up that lead, but there's something different out in that bullpen so far this year. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, it was Francisco Cervelli's night. He drove in three of the four Marlins runs with a three run home run out to right field. He's been a burst of life um, into this Marlins offense, surprisingly from an unexpected source. And he's also been huge for the pitching staff. Mattingly talked about it after the game last night, just settling guys down. He's a professional. He's a veteran. Um, and he's been a huge part of this team so far. And that wasn't really expected because, you know, Alfaro was supposed to be the guy behind the plate. Um, but since he's gone down, Cervelli has stepped up and he's been really, really good. Um, Matt Joyce had a two for four night. That's the kind of stuff that we're looking for from him. And Jesus Aguilar went two for three with a walk and a double that he hit falling away. He hit it to the warning track. He's got crazy power. Um, so the offense had four runs, not the loudest night from the offense. The bats were kind of quiet, but they still looked pretty good. Um, and, and the bullpen, give them credit, you know. Ben, don't break was kind of the way um, that it was for the Marlins bullpen last night. Um, but they didn't break, which was huge. So now, okay, let's, let's just... I know we're all really excited, and I know everybody's freaking out. I am too. Um, but let's talk about some concerns um, and just kind of bring it back here to the earth, to down to earth for a second, um, because I do have concerns about this Marlins team um, in terms of how you know I think they can win ball games, but how sustainable this kind of play is. Um, I mean, for any team, it's not sustainable to be you know seven and one in eight games, um, but. How well can they play going forward is obviously the question. They only have to go 500 the rest of the way to win like 32 ball games, which we think might be the magic number. Um, but can they play 500 ball the rest of the way? These are going to be some big determining factors. First of all, the bullpen needs relief, right? Like they've been relieving everybody for, you know, a week now, but they need some relief themselves. Um, Short starts have been the story of the season for the Marlins. They worked five relievers last night, and the bullpen was taxed in bull, uh, in Baltimore. You know, we talked about the bullpen game yesterday. Um, so the bullpen needs help. The Marlins need a bad, a long start in the worst way possible. Um, so hopefully, you know, in the next couple of days, we've got Castano going tonight. We'll talk about him in a second, and Pablo going tomorrow. I think Pablo's the guy that we need to look to for a long start. You know, six, seven innings. Even five would be nice if Castano can go five tonight. Um, that would be huge. But, yeah, the Marlins need needs somebody to eat some innings here. Um, let's move on to the next concern. This stays on the pitching staff. The differentials in ERA and fielding independent pitching. This is something that should scare Marlins fans a little bit. The Marlins staff as a whole, um, their staff and their bullpen, have the fifth best ERA but they have the sixth worst fielding independent pitching. That suggests that there's some luck going into what the Marlins have right now with their pitching staff and how good the bullpen has been. Let's take a look at the bullpen. They've got the seventh best ERA and the eighth worst fielding independent pitching. So it's a little bit scary from the Marlins there. You know, um, uh, it, 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 it's not what you're looking for in terms of getting some good luck, um, but you know, it's working so far. So what can you say? Um, on the offensive side of the ball, the biggest thing for me right now is that Corey Dickerson, who's going to be such a big part of this offense, he looks kind of lost at the plate. Um, it's been a tough go for him the last few days. And I'm not, you know, overly concerned about it. Um, he's a professional hitter. He's going to get the job done and, you know, he'll hit well for the Marlins. But they definitely need to get him going um, to sustain the offense because getting it from guys like Cervelli, and, and, you know, some of the other guy Joyce and some of the other guys on this team isn't, you know, who you're looking for to be the pillar of your offense. Corey Dickerson is who you're looking for to be the pillar of the offense. So the Marlins need to get him going. 
Let's turn our attention to tonight. I've got the lineup right here for you. Let's take a look at it. Um, the Mets are throwing a lefty, so the Marlins are going with their lefty lineup. VR leads off as always. He's playing shortstop tonight um, as John Birdie is in the two spot hitting second and playing second base. Aguilar's in the three spot. He'll play first. Dickerson, there he is in the cleanup spot as he's been. Um, he is in left field. Brian Anderson, third base, hitting fifth. Cervelli's behind the plate. He's hitting sixth. Um, Brinson is back in the lineup with a lefty. It seems like um, Mattingly's going to platoon him against lefties. He's in right field. He's hitting seventh. Logan Forsythe is the DH tonight. He's hitting eighth. And then Monte Harrison, our boy, is back in the lineup. He's hitting ninth and playing center field. So um, Daniel Castano is the starter for tonight, as I mentioned. He came over in the Azuna trade. He was kind of the throw-in in the Ozuna trade, but he's had some good numbers in the minor leagues, and he's getting his shot tonight. It's going to be the eighth straight night. The Marlins have a major league debut on their roster. Um, it's, it's crazy what this roster looks like right now. But nonetheless, it should be a fun one um, against the New York Mets. Tomorrow night is DeGrom and Pablo, and if the Marlins win again tonight, you'll hear from me tomorrow because you're going to be hearing from me until they lose. So we'll talk soon, and go fish.